I am coming. I am coming, y'all. Hello, friends. Um, I'm late. I know. I know I'm late. And I'm trying to get my stuff together because... I'm all over the place. Hello, sweet friends. Hello, hello. Happy Thursday. I hope y'all are all having an amazing, amazing day. Um, I'm going to get situated here. I'm in my jammies. Maybe you are too. We're just going to have a little jammy Bible session. I feel like my um, camera is a little dirty. Okay, maybe that helps a little bit. I don't know. Let's turn this down a little bit. There we go. Hello, sweet friends. I hope you're having an amazing day. Happy Thursday. Um, welcome to Bible Study with Kimmy. If you have never been, make sure that you say hey so that I can say hey back. Um, I have my jammies on. I have been oh, behind the computer, going crazy, doing schoolwork. Hello, hello. Um, doing schoolwork, just a crazy, crazy person. And just trying to get everything done. And y'all, I got ready for Bible study. And I had like my gym clothes on still from today. I haven't even showered. <laughs> um, I haven't even showered <laughs> from the gym today. And I had to throw on some clothes. And I'm like, oh my gosh, um, I need to get dressed for Bible study. So that's what took me so long. But getting dressed means throwing on jammies. So if you're in your jammies, we're out here. Um, okay, so we are going to continue um, in our series called Besties from the Beginning. If you are new here and this is the first time you have watched Bible Study with me, hello and welcome to the little girl gang. I pray that I see you um, next week too. Um, we just have a lot of fun out on here and we talk about Jesus in our jammies, you know. Um, am I fully online? I am fully online and it is kicking my booty. It is kicking my butt. Um, yay, Caitlin's in her jammies too. Okay, good. Um, I'm not the only one not dressed for the occasion, am I right? I don't think anything's wrong with wearing your jammies and talking about Jesus. Um, but anyways, we're going to get started. We have been in the series called Besties from the Beginning, and Cassie says same. It's 9 o'clock here. I know there's different time zones, but Eastern Standard Time, it's 9 o'clock. Um, okay, Kimmy, stop being squirrel-minded and get to the point. Um, we have been in the series called Besties from the Beginning, and I have absolutely um, been loving this series. I think it is transformational, and I think it's really speaking to not only my heart and spirit, but also so many other people. I've had people reach out and just talk about how much they love this series and how it just kind of gives them a foundational um, view and understanding of Jesus, of the Bible, and kind of where to begin. So my mindset when I started this series was I wanted something that allowed people who had never touched their Bible or whose Bible sits on their bedside table but never gets picked up. I wanted something that allowed them to kind of familiarize <laughs> um, themselves with the Bible and um, kind of who Jesus is, what he did while he was here on earth, what he did for us, and also kind of showed or gave us a representation of God's love and how much he loves us. So, um, so many times I get the question, Kimmy, I've never really read my Bible or I want to start reading my Bible more and I don't know where to start. And I always give the same answer and I always say start in the Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that's going to be in the New Testament. And I just wanted to kind of randomly select one, but I do have a little bit of favoritism because my favorite Gospel is John. So, we have been... That should be your Bible show. Jammies and Jesus. Ain't that cute? Oh, my Lord. I love that. Um... So we have been in the book of John and we have just had some really good just conversation about it. Um, and I just love what this is doing for us. So last week I was at my sister's house and I had to use my sister's Bible. And so I have not gone back into John because I always like to go. I always tell y'all this at the end. I always like to go back and reread scripture that I've already read because you kind of get a new understanding every time you read it. But I have not for this Bible study for this series so far, I have not gone back and reread. I know I've kind of given y'all that assignment, but I've always just kind of wanted it to be fresh on my mind when it came time for Bible study because I believe so often, um, y'all, I've literally like gone to Bible studies, whether it be online or whatever, and they have like, and nothing is wrong with having material. Nothing is wrong with having like, um, 
what do you call that? Not material, but like guided, like this is my church. Like for instance, I don't fill this in, but like at my church, they have like guided notes and stuff like that. Nothing is wrong with that. <laughs> and for some of my organized people, my to-do list gals, if you will, um, you really like that because it kind of structures things and you are able to retain it better. Um, but sometimes it's just super nice to jump fresh into the word, to just jump in, not really knowing what God has for you, not really saying, yes, Lord, prepare my heart to receive what you have, but just to kind of freshly jump in and see um, what's in store and what his word says and to just kind of hit yourself with a surprise and to not always have it all together. Together. We don't have it all together and I don't got it all together because I'll be honest with y'all because I'm an honest person Half these Bible studies not even half more than half 75% of these Bible studies I literally have just eaten supper just taken an exam just got off the phone Just let the dog out or whatever and I just hop on here and we just jump into God's Word And we just let him reveal to us all of these things and I just love that about it I love the spontaneity nosity <laughs> I don't know how to say that. The spontaneous aspect of that. It's just something about that. And I'm not a spontaneous person. I am a Enneagram one, y'all. I like my ducks in a row. I like a plan. And I'm not a spontaneous person. But for some reason, when it comes to God's word, I kind of just like to just say, hit me with what you got tonight, God. So that's what we've been doing. Um, and that's kind of where my heart has been with all of this. So with that, that long-winded response, um, the last thing I believe we talked about was Jesus and the Samaritan woman. I think we only covered chapter four. Um, no, no. Let me see. I got to remember exactly where, where we were at. I have the same PJs. These are from Walmart, y'all. I have, so I have these. I have the blue pair and then I have, oh, Miss Steph, my sweet uh, bestie, got me the gray and pink ones. These are the best jammies ever. They're literally like nine or ten dollars at Walmart and they're just perfect. They're so soft and thin. I love them. I love them. So that was side note, sidetrack. Um, so then I'm trying to remember where we left off y'all y'all might have to re recall rejog my memory um do y'all remember no girl you're fine okay uh, y'all i should be better at this anyways we <laughs> we are going to start at verse 27 and we're just gonna roll with it okay because, hey, Danielle, we're just going to roll with it because I don't remember exactly. Y'all, I got a lot going on in this little head of mine. Forgive me. Um, okay, so we're going to just jump in at verse 27. We're still in chapter 4. Um, so, to give you just a quick little tidbit of, like, recap, kind of. Um, we read about Jesus and the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. And Jesus is there. He's taken this long trek. He's come with a few of his disciples. And his disciples have gone into town to get some food and just collect some other things that they need for the rest of their journey. And when he gets to the well, he just sits down. He just needs a break. He just needs some rest. Um, and when he gets there, a Samaritan woman is there. And at the time, the Samaritan people and Jews were not allowed to kind of speak to each other. They just didn't associate. And so he sits there at the well. And this woman comes over to draw up some water from the well. And Jesus asks her um, for some water. He's thirsty. He doesn't want to get up. He doesn't want to have to haul the bucket and draw the water up and all that kind of stuff. And so he asks the Samaritan woman, will she draw some water up? Um, and she's just kind of like blown away first by the fact that a Jew is talking to her when they're not, you know, Jews are not supposed to be associate, associating or having anything to do with the Samaritans. But also the fact that he's a man and she's a woman. And at the time there was just a really big um, disconnect. You know, the women's roles were very different from the men's at the time. And it was just kind of this whole deal. And basically what Jesus it does is he reveals himself as the Messiah to her. Um, he tells her that he can offer her um, something that will quench her thirst, but will no longer make her thirsty anymore. And I kind of gave this like kind of funny, kind of crazy analogy about the fact, um, crazy analogy about the fact that she had, that's probably one of her duties as a woman at the time for the family is to go and retrieve the water, to haul the bucket, to get the water up. I've never worked a well in my life, but I can only imagine. Um, 
Oh, thank you, Chastity. That made me smile. Thank you. Um, and so I can only imagine, I don't know, I've never worked a well a day in my life, but I can only imagine hauling the bucket, drawing the water up in the bucket, then having to carry the bucket, Some perhaps sometimes it was two buckets, to back to the family, and that just being something that you dread to do. It's like one of those things like you dread to fold laundry. I dread folding laundry. She probably dreads <laughs> dreads drawing the water up in the well and so Jesus kind of offers her this hope and offers her this thing that's going to quench all of her thirst where she'll never have to draw water up from the well and he offers um himself he offers God and the the truth and he also offers um the hope of the hope of eternal life and to have eternity with God and I just love that so much about that little moment between Jesus and her uh, and I also love that it was a woman um because I feel like a lot of times there's just such a disconnect between women and like um maybe discipleship or women and ministry women and religion Christianity or whatever um a lot of people just have mixed opinions and views on that Y'all, here I am in the flesh. I love to see women preaching the word. I love to see women in their Bible. I love to see women minister. I love it, love it, love it. And I think that is biblical. And that's my view on it. And I love it. I love it. I love it, love it. So I love that there's that sweet, precious, intimate moment between Jesus and her. So much. Um, okay, so let me scroll up. Let me scroll up. I'm seeing y'all's comments, and I want this to be interactive. Um, so, Miss Steph is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Um, Kimmy's podcast on Ether's. So, I do not have a podcast, but for my 76 girlies on here at YouTube, I am starting a podcast, and I have not shared that with anybody. That is not a public thing, other than like my little family and a call and stuff. But I'm starting a podcast. I'm trying to come up with a name with it, and we are going to kabang it, and we're going to like turn Bible studies into like a podcast, girly talk, chit chat session. I'm so excited. I don't have a podcast, but I do have YouTube videos of Esther, so you can go to my YouTube and watch those. Um, she meant YouTube. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so we're going to continue on. Verse 27. I'm going to say a quick prayer. I'm so excited. I am so excited. I'm trying to come up with a name. And it's one of those things. This is going to kind of be a chit-chat moment with us, too. Um, it's going to be one of those things where um, I want it to be like, I don't know. It's going to be one of those things where I have to really pray on what I'm going to name my podcast. Do y'all ever have those things? Um, new to the Bible, Bible, Bible study world. I want to know God more and more. Were you in the right place, girlfriend? This is an exciting little space to be here on TikTok. And we are going to learn our Bibles together. We're going to learn God's word and his promises. And we're going to let scripture just kind of saute all around us. So you are in the right place. You stay on there until we're done. Um, but yeah, for my podcast name, I definitely want it to be something that like I pray about. I don't want it just to be like, okay, I'm going to call it like, Kimmy's chit chats or something like that like I want it to be something that is really true and dear to my heart something that the Lord places on my heart and so I've just been praying fervently over it um just that the Lord will reveal something to me like something just kind of click or something I don't know so yeah the Holy Spirit will lead me in that and so I don't want to rush it I don't want to rush it because I love Bible study I love these little sessions we get to come on here but I do want a podcast and I want it to be something where yes we study the Bible yes it is Bible related Yes, it is a way to share the goodness and glory um, and hope um, of Jesus. But I also want it to be more girl-related, kind of, you know, because I come on here and I feel like I'm talking to a slew of girls, and I know that I am, but I also know that I have some guys on here, you know. So I want my podcast to be more geared toward women and also to kind of focus and study um, more on what women go through and how that relates to the Bible and what Jesus says about that and kind of have more of my own spin to things, you know, if you will. So I'm excited. Um, Jamie's and Jesus. Hello, hello. Okay, so I'm going to say a quick little prayer, and then we're going to jump into John chapter 4, verse 27. Yeah, I believe. Okay, so if you're not there, go there. It's going to be in between um luke and acts and it's going to be in your new testament if you're new to the bible it's okay girlfriend you ain't got to know your books one by one you ain't got to know them in order 
you just got to know, go to your New Testament, which is going to begin with your Gospels, and you're going to go to the book of John. And if you can't find it like that, go to your table of contents. Table of contents? Yeah, it's been forever since I've used a table of contents. You would think in college I use them all the time. Um, but go to your table of contents, find the book of John, and that's where we're going to be. Um, if you're super new to your Bible, I'll show you this. So you'll open it up, and these bold numbers are going to be your chapters. So, in each book, the bold numbers are going to be your chapters. And then if you look even closer, you're going to see little tiny numbers before each sentence, and that's going to be your verse. So, we are going to go to the bold number 4, and we're going to go to the verse, the small little number 27. Um, okay. Leah, I am so excited for you, girl. You, The journey you are about to begin is just going to be, whew, I'm so excited. I'm so glad you're here, too. Like, I love just seeing different people with different walks of faith. Or not different walks of faith, but, you know, some only read their Bible, like, every once in a while. Some read it every day and that kind of thing. So, I'm so excited. Yes, you will never feel more love and peace. And being on here with us will just also kind of aid in that. It's so important. Y'all, can y'all tell my chatterbox tonight? It's so important to have a group of girls or a group of friends or some sense of community that encourages that relationship with Jesus. And that, you know, there's going to be days where you have your doubts. There's going to be days where you just don't feel like opening your Bible or you don't feel like praying or you don't feel like doing devotion. And having just a little small little group, whether it be in person, whether it be um line whether it be wherever to just kind of encourage you and just kind of boost you in that is so 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 important um what bible so let me tell y'all that real quick before we pray um i love my bible but i have read i read my sister's bible also and it was the niv version but i really like my bible and it is the she reads truth bible y'all can kind of see it engraved there and it is the Christian Standard Version, CS, CSV, which I love. It is linked in my Amazon storefront. You can find it there. Also, Hobby Lobby sells them, and they do 40% like sales all the time. So, you can look there, too. She Reads Truth. It's the CSV version. So, I'm going to go to prayer. Hopefully, you got John pulled up. And let's get started, girls. <laughs> okay. Um, dear Lord, thank you for this day and thank you for all of my many blessings. Lord, thank you for this platform and for giving me just these sweet girls to talk to, to minister to. Lord, I pray that your goodness just overflows us tonight. Lord, I pray that you just bring something new in our heart. Lord, you spark up something that just allows us to see you and to know you more and more and more. Lord, I pray that you create an intimate, precious space for us tonight so we can just see your glory and see your goodness and lord feel your presence i pray, pray that anything that comes off of my mouth and off of my lips lord it just glorifies you lord decrease me and increase you so that we can spread your name lord i just pray that you just touch one of these girls tonight in what we read through your scripture thank you for this platform thank you for giving me the opportunity to just share your word and share your name lord in your sweet and most precious name i pray amen Okay, so let's get started. Um, let's get started. We're going to go to verse 27. Um, and Jesus kind of reveals himself to the Samaritan woman, says that he is um, the Messiah. It's pretty much is what he, he reveals to her. In this book, in this part of John, we're going to see that Jesus is starting to perform miracles. He's starting to reveal himself through miracles. And I have said this several times throughout this little journey, um, but it isn't until Jesus starts to prove himself, like actually physically starts to heal the sick and starts to like show himself worthy through the miracles that he's performing. That is when people begin to... Um, that's when people begin to follow him. People begin, I always say this, people begin to like raise a brow at who he is and what he's saying and what he stands for. And um, one of the things, one of the biggest messages of Jesus, of his ministry while on earth is to go, go and repent and sin no more for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, and people did not like to hear that, okay? He came into the picture because, remember, at the book of John, John says, you know, one is coming that is greater than I. One is coming that is greater than I, but also was before I. And people were like, oh, 
hold up, wait a minute, like, that's gotta be crazy. Like, you're here first. How are you saying that he was here first when I, you clearly were here first, you know? So, people are just going crazy. People don't understand. They're confused. Um, people begin to doubt. People don't like to hear that they're doing wrong. You know, when you're so comfortable in your sin and you have someone come forth and convict you of that sin, they don't like to hear that. And even the people that knew that they were doing wrong and had that sort of guilt or whatever, they still didn't want to hear that, you know, hey, like the kingdom of heaven, your eternity, your forgiveness, you literally are going to die and you are going to go to hell if you don't repent and sin no more, believe and follow me. You are not going to go to heaven. And people don't like to hear that. So they began to doubt. They began to rebuke. They began to mock. They began to ridicule Jesus and everything that he did. But when he started performing miracles and when he started to prove himself that is when people were like hmm maybe we should listen maybe we should follow and so that's kind of what we're seeing with what we're reading so verse 27 says just then his disciples arrived remember they left to go get food and collect some things for their journey and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman remember i told you there was some sort of disconnect with the role of women during that time um and yet one said what do you want or why are you talking with her so they're also confused. They're like, Jesus, wait up, hold a minute. Why are you talking to this woman? And then the woman left her water jar, went into town and told the people. So she's like, oh my word, the Messiah is here. And she goes and tells everybody, which is what I would do, you know. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and made their way to him. In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? And then verse 34 says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, Jesus told him. So basically is what he's saying. It's also this same kind of um, analogy is not the right word. There's a certain liter um, literary word I'm trying to think of. But remember when he's talking to the woman at the well and he says that I have something that will quench your thirst, you know, entirely. And he's talking about God. He's talking about the goodness and the glory and the hope of, of God. And he's just saying, if you follow him, then you won't have to thirst anymore. You know, he is the living well. And basically, he's kind of saying the same thing down here is that I don't need to eat right now because I have food to eat that you don't know about. He's basically saying, I have a role, I have a job to perform, and that job is to come here and to finish his work. And I love that because Jesus kind of reveals himself even more through saying like, hey, God sent me. I have a job here. Metaphor. That's it. I have a job here to do, and that's to come and complete the work that he has asked me to do. So Jesus says, don't you say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper can rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored and you haven't benefited from their labor. Labor. We're going to go and we're going to chunk that. If you've never heard of chunking, um, I did this all throughout college. I still continue to do this throughout college. Um, sometimes you read a little paragraph or a passage or something like that and you're like, what the heck did I just read? And you just don't understand it. You're like, Kimmy, literally, you just read that through your brain. Y'all, I'm itching. Accutane makes me itch. So these little marks is me itching. <laughs> Um, sometimes I read things and I'm like, Kimmy, you literally just read it and you have no idea what you just read. Sometimes your brain just processes things like that. So it's easy if you just kind of chunk them through and you kind of understand it in chunks. So what he says is verse, um, uh, verse 35, he says, don't you say there are still four months, then comes the harvest. So what they're saying is he says that his disciples, his people are saying there are four months before harvest. Harvest, you know, is when the crop, the food, whatever, the good um, is in full bloom, ready to be picked, ready to be harvested, ready to be consumed. It's when it things begin to flourish, okay? And he says, listen to what I'm telling you. He's like, listen to what I'm telling you here. He says, open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. So he's saying, look at everything that surrounds you. Look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. Things are flourishing. Things are growing. Things are ready to be harvested. Things are ready to be picked. Things are ready to be consumed and processed and to be taken advantage of. Look around. 
Because they're saying there's only there's four more months before the harvest. And Jesus is saying, no, the harvest is now. It's time for things to be picked up. Times for good to, a time for goods to be consumed and so forth. And so he says, the reaper, remember what's the saying, y'all, where you reap what you sow? Um, meaning what the labor that you put in, you get the benefits or the negatives from it. So whatever you reap, no, whatever you sow, you're going to reap, you know. Um, and so he says the reaper, so that's the person that receives the benefits, is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life. So the reaper, the person who receives the advantages, receives the benefits, receives the good or the disadvantages or the negative, depending on the situation, it says, this is a good thing, is that it's already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life. So that the sower, the sower is the person that puts in the work, so that the sower and the reaper can rejoice together. So what they're, what he's basically saying here is that the put, person that's putting in the work, the person that's um, doing the job, getting it done, the person that's, um, yeah, like I said, putting, doing the job and getting it done is going to reap good benefits, and the reaper that's receiving it is also going to receive good benefits so that they can both rejoice together. One's not going to be upset and the other happy, and the other's not going to be upset and the other happy. It's going to be a kind of thing together. That's basically what I'm trying to say. Are you going to bed? Mm -hmm. Okay, good night, love good you. Night, My mom is going to bed. Okay, um, so, so, and then it says, verse 37, for in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps, which is basically what we just kind of said. Summary, quick little short summary. And then verse 38 says, I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored and you have benefited from their labor. So what he's basically saying here is that you came to receive something you didn't put the work in for, something you didn't do. And I love that kind of connection to Jesus that it makes right there because as we know now, obviously many, 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 many years down the line, you know, way out of Jesus's time is we understand that Jesus paid the ultimate price. He went and he died on the cross for our sins, for forgiveness of our sins, for eternity, for hope, for love, for peace, for mercy, for grace, for us, when we didn't do a darn thing to deserve it. I said darn, probably wasn't the right thing to say, but yes, I'm on here saying darn, okay? We did not deserve a darn thing that he did. And so what he's basically saying is that, look, you are the reaper and you're receiving the goods, you're, you're receiving the fruit of something you didn't even put in the work for. You didn't spend hours and labor and labor and labor in order to receive that. And that's basically what he's saying. And I just love that because it just reminds me of Jesus is that, yes, he did come to this earth to save us. And he did come to this earth to die so that he could offer forgiveness of our sins and he could offer eternity and the slew of other things, y'all. He did. I mean, that was the main point. But we also have to remember the fact that he came here and gave us the fruit, the fruit of life, y'all. He wants us to have a good life here. He wants us to be comfortable here. But he also, our main purpose is to follow him and to share his word. That is our main purpose here on earth. Quick little side note. If you're wondering what your purpose is, so many people are like, I need to find my purpose. No, your purpose is to follow him. Okay, your purpose is to follow him, to share his goodness. That is the great commission is to follow him and to, or the great commission is to share his name. But your purpose here on earth is to follow him, to submit to him and to worship him all your days long. Now your calling is something different. So many people confuse a calling versus a purpose. Your purpose here on earth, the reason you were created was to worship him. Even though he came to die, even though he gave us such fruits and such goodness and such mercy, grace, love, peace, the list goes on, that we did not deserve and that we didn't put the labor on, even though that is our purpose here. Kind of like us going to church and not applying what the pastor says to our lives. Yes, exactly. Leah says, is the book of John from the point of view of John? Yes, it is. So John is um, John the Baptist. He is the one who baptized Jesus and the other people. And yes, it is from the um, viewpoint of John. Okay, um, so we're going to continue. We're going to go to verse 39. It says, 
Um, we're still in chapter 4. It says, Now many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of what he, what he said, and they told the woman, We no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard for ourselves and know this is really the Savior of the world. So this woman tells all the other Samaritans, like, Hey, he knew that I had done this and this and this, and he revealed himself as the Messiah in this way. And then Jesus stays with them for one to two days. And they didn't necessarily believe that he was the Messiah, and Jesus was who he says he was based off the woman's word, but off of Jesus' word. And I want to tell y'all something about that, because I've read this one time before, and I have it highlighted. So often, we think that being a Christian and loving Jesus, following Jesus, however you want to put it, is based off what you hear, okay? Based off what you see, that quote on Pinterest, that Instagram story, um, that Bible study session. We follow Jesus through other people when if we would just spend like one to two days, we would follow Jesus because of who Jesus is. If we would just spend one to two days just being in his presence, one to two days just being in his word, many more days, y'all, than that. But I'm just saying, for the simple fact of if you would spend just like two days with Jesus in his word, soaking up what he has for you, literally, if you put all other distractions aside and you spent two days with him, it would no longer be about what other people were persuading you to believe, about what other people testified. Do not get me wrong. I think testimonies are powerful. I think people can be saved and transformed through others' testimonies. I believe that wholeheartedly. But I think if we would spend more intimate, personal, direct time with Jesus, we would see Jesus for who he is, not who other people say he is. And I think that this kind of touches us that touches at that because the other Samaritans are like, okay, you told us this, but okay, we're going to take into consideration what you think or how Jesus and your conversation with him affected you and how that kind of came about from the beginning. But what we're really focused on now is what he says and who he says he is. And that's why we believe him now. Okay. So I just love that. Okay. Verse 43 says, after two days, he left there for Galilee. Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Um, I don't, I've read that one time before too, y'all, and I got to thinking, you know, some people like in today's world, and I want y'all to conversate with me on this and tell me what you think. Some people in today's world are like, like people now, like modern day, like 2023, um, thank you, Madison, modern day, like 2023, some people like consider themselves, and I believe it prophets like they do like they prophesize they are like full-on prophets they were called by god to be prophets and it's so good to have a prophet in your corner um and, and a lot of times these come through people that you never even expected them to be a lot of times like i'll have a friend or someone online or something like that and you obviously have to discern your yourself and you have to ask god for discernment through the holy spirit but a lot of times people will say, Kimmy, you know, I've just been feeling this thing about you and I really just think that this is happening. And then it happens like, oh my Lord, like I literally have a prophet in my corner. And one time I was reading this and I was like, okay, so Jesus testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So is that saying to us, like, if you feel like you have been called by God to prophesize his word and to prophesize whatever, you know, the whole night or whatever, that you should go. I mean, I know we're all called to go and share the gospel, go and to share God's work. But does that mean someone who may be a prophet or may be called by God to have that kind of role, even now in today's world, that we're not supposed to be where we're from. We're supposed to go. We're supposed to go on the mission trips. We're supposed to go and minister. And um, I just, I love that. So I don't know if that's what that means by that. But I do take a lot of heart in the fact that Jesus did testify that. And that comes from John is that Jesus testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Because a prophet's thing to do is to go and declare Jesus' promises. You know, what's told because of his promises and all that kind of stuff. I'm not a theologian when it comes to stuff like that. I'm not a Bible nerd when it comes to stuff like that. It's just kind of something that I kind of had sparking up in my heart the last time I read it. I was like, hmm, what that means? So, anyways, that was a squirrel moment. Let's continue to verse 45. 
So when they entered Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him because they had seen everything he did in Jerusalem during the festival, for they had also gone to the festival. So um, now we're going to go to verse 46. It says, He went again to the Cana, Cana of Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. Remember, um, they had these buckets, or they had these, they needed wine or whatever, and they had all this water, and they were like, we're out, of, we're out of wine, whatever, we need wine, we need this, blah, 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 blah. And then they go, and then they come back, and they see that it's barrels, barrels full. We're not talking like little tiny wine glasses. We're talking barrels full of wine, where Jesus turns the water into wine. And so they've gone back to that same place where he did that miracle. And it says, There was a certain royal official whose son was ill there. And when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea into Galilee, he went to him and pleaded with him to come down and heal his son since he was about to die. Yes, this is in John. This is chapter 4. Jesus told him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. <laughs> oh, I just about choked on the word. So this man, okay, he's been seeing what Jesus has been doing, okay? And obviously it just says his son is ill, his son is sick, and he sees what Jesus Jesus has been doing, and he recognized that, hey, like, this guy could, like, potentially heal my son. Like, he could perform a miracle, and my son could no longer be sick. And so it isn't until he sees Jesus doing these things, like I kind of mentioned at the beginning, people did not follow Jesus. People did not believe him. People weren't even nice. People weren't even sweet to Jesus until they saw for their, their own eyes what he was doing. They had to see it to believe it kind of thing, which I think is kind of crazy, okay? But, you know, um, anyways, and so he says, maybe, like, he can actually heal my son. And so Jesus kind of exclaims this moment. And sometimes, y'all, Jesus is funny, okay? Like, people that get on me for having an attitude, obviously sometimes, and I know Jesus had no harsh content whatsoever with saying what he says in some book, you know, some things we've read in the Bible where I kind of laugh at Jesus' remarks. I know that. Um, but I think he's kind of funny, and I think he's got a little bit of an attitude. Don't nobody talk about my attitude, okay? Because Jesus can sometimes kind of have an attitude, if you will. And so, um, he says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Like, he's just saying, you know, you know, I can't prove who I am unless I do something for you, unless you benefit in some way. And he's just like, oh, like, this is just his moment. Like, oh my gosh, like, this is getting on my nerves kind of deal, you know? And so then verse 49 says, um, sir, the official said to him, come down before my boy dies. Go, Jesus told him, your son will live. The man believed what Jesus said to him and departed. Verse 51 says, While he was still going down, his servants met him, saying that his boy was alive. He asked them at what time he got better. Yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him, they answered. The father realized this was the very hour at which Jesus had told him, Your son will live. So he believed him. So he himself believed him, along with the whole household. So Jesus healed the sick. Jesus made it so his son didn't die. And um, the guy believed him because at the same time Jesus said that he would live, his son got better. Verse 54 says, Now this was also the second sign that Jesus performed after he came from Judea to Galilee. Okay? So we see so far he's talked to the Samaritan woman. He's turned the water into wine. He has healed the official's son. And now we're going to see his third sign, and it's going to be him healing the sick. So chapter 5, we're going to go, let's see, we got 10 minutes. We're going to go down, we're just going to keep reading, and I'll stop us at some point. <laughs> um yeah, Jesus only had to speak healing and it was done. He didn't have to go and put his hand on the boy. He didn't have to go and give him some medicine. He didn't have to go and hooray over top of him, sprinkle a little sprinkle on his head. He didn't have to do any of that. All he had to do was speak. And I love that. And if you think about that in today's terms, is whatever you're going through, sickness, maybe you got a diagnosis at the doctor, maybe it's something a friend is going through or someone who you love is going through or whatever it may be, just know that, like, you don't, Jesus, you can pray and pray fervently and intently and involve God in what you're going through. And literally all he has to do is speak. Do you realize that all he has to do right now and the world would stop turning? He just has to speak. There is power in his voice. And I love that because that is what that little clip, that little chunk reveals to us. 
So chapter 5 says, After this, a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So he goes back. By the sheep, sheep gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool, and it's called Bathsheba. In, I can't say this word, Ar Aramic. Is that right? Which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of the disabled. They're blind, lame, and paralyzed. Um, so I was looking down here, and it says, I love my Bible because it says, um, Bethsaida, other, other say Bethsaida. Okay, so I guess there's two different ways to pronounce that. Beth, Bethsaida, other say Bethsaida. So Bethsaida is how I'm going to say it, okay? <laughs> um, Okay, so here there are people who have disabilities. They're blind, they're lame, and they're paralyzed. Verse 5 says, One man who was there had been disabled for 38 years, y'all. Disabled for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and realized he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to get well? Number uh, Verse 7 says, Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. Get up. Jesus told him, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man got up, got, instantly the man got well, picked up his mat and started to walk. Again, it's not about Jesus laying his hand on him. It's not about Jesus providing a wheelchair. It's not about Jesus picking him up and putting him where he needed to go. Jesus simply said, get up. And the power in his voice, the power in who he is, literally healed the man from not being able to walk and allowed him to pick up his mat and to go. And this part right here, it always breaks my heart when I read it. And it says, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. So basically it's saying that he's going and no one helps him, but someone always goes down ahead of him. That's where he's trying to get, but someone goes before him. And what Jesus is saying here is that, hey, I'm going to heal you. Now get up, pick up your mat and walk. And the guy gets healed, he picks up his mat, and he walks. Now the, day, now the day was the Sabbath, and so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, This is the Sabbath. The law prohibits you from picking up your mat. <laughs> he replied, The man who made me well told me, Pick up your mat and walk. So remember on Sabbath, that was the day of rest. And what they're saying is, Hey, like it's, you're not supposed to pick up. You, this, this law prohibits you from picking up your mat. And he's saying, Well, Jesus told me to pick up my mat and walk. <laughs> so this man who told you um, pick Pick up your mat and walk, they asked. But the man who was healed did not know who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd. So I kind of messed up. He didn't say, Jesus told me. He said, that man over there, he told me. But Jesus had already slipped away into the crowd. Jesus was gone at this point. After this, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. The man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. So at that time, they really, 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 really heavily believed and focused on and obeyed, abided, obeyed, abided the law. And Sabbath was a day of rest. You weren't supposed to do stuff like that. And so this man picks his mat up and he walks because Jesus told him to and literally... They didn't know who it was at the time, but then later in the temple, the guy sees Jesus there, and Jesus is like, hey, you are well, so go and sin no more. And so many people focus on that statement, and I do believe that Jesus, like even the um, lady who was, you know, remember the story with the Pharisees who had the stones and wanted the stone, the woman for adultery, um, and they, at the end of, what book is that? I cannot think. Um, that's in John 2, I think. John 8, I think it's John 8. Um, at the end of the sentence, Jesus says to um, the lady and also here to this man, um, he says, go and sin no more. And y'all, I think, I definitely believe and I definitely feel certain that Jesus meant go and sin no more. Like, don't participate in that sin anymore. Don't do this or don't do that. I definitely think he meant that. But I think there's a deeper, more intimate understanding to it. And what I think about that is this, is that, with the lady with the rocks that they were trying to stone because she was caught in adulterous acts, 
a lot of times she was a prostitute obviously and a lot of times during that time that women were born into prostitute they started at a young age what would happen is people didn't want their kids so instead of offering them up for adoption or something like that is they would just go and put them out on the street corner where the trash cans lay where garbage was picked up and small children infants even at the time would get picked up and they would get caught into child slavery child sex trafficking and all this kind of stuff and literally women would just be only experienced into a world of um into a world <laughs> Colin made me made me blush okay they would <laughs> and sidetracks um they would be they would have only experienced a world of prostitution or of like adulterous acts or of sex trafficking or whatever and so that's all that they knew and perhaps in this moment this man who we have just been told has literally been disabled for 38 years that's all that he knew all that he knew was to not be able to walk all that he knew was to not be able to just pick up his mat and walk and y'all perhaps what Jesus is saying here is like you are free you are free. Go and sin no more because you are free of that sin. And even to the woman, remember he's writing in the dust. We don't know what Jesus was writing in the dust. But remember he says, go and sin no more. And maybe he's saying, look, I have healed you. I have healing. I have freedom in my name and freedom in my voice, freedom in my power. And maybe he's saying, look, like, go and sin no more. You don't have to be a part of that life. You don't have to be paralyzed anymore. You don't have to not be able to walk anymore. You don't have to commit yourself to prostitution or whatever. Look, I am free. I am freeing you from that sin, from that bondage, from that captivity of sin. So go and sin no more. And so I really think that, yes, Jesus is telling her not to sin anymore. Yes, Jesus is telling him not to sin anymore. We're going to get to chapter eight. And we're going to read more about that. And I love that that's probably one of my favorite um, stories in the Bible, but or at least in the book of John. But I really think that's what Jesus is saying. Like, yes, don't go and sin anymore. But let's just say, like, maybe Jesus was also meaning, like, you are no longer held captive, <clears throat> held in bondage from what the sin was holding you from or what the sin was no bonding you for like i don't know i just feel like jesus had more to say so many people focus on that like you know if jesus forgives you or if jesus transforms your life you don't need to sin anymore and if you do you're gonna upset him and you're not gonna be the good person or the whatever you were when he first released you from that sin and i do think i don't think that's it at all i think jesus died and gives us enough grace and enough mercy to know that we are free from that sin, and even if we do slip up, we are there to call on him to ask for forgiveness. And so, I don't know. That's just a quick little tangent, I guess. Oh, yay, Dakota! That is exciting, girl. I know that made you smile. That probably warmed your little heart. Okay. Let's see. We got a couple minutes. Okay, so then, um, like I said, this is when some of the hastiness starts to pick up towards Jesus because they realize that he's going against what they believe, okay? Um, first of all, he's saying, like, um, that he's the Messiah, that he is God. They're like, you are not God. Like, they're just kind of ridiculing him, mocking him, targeting him, picking and bullying and all this kind of stuff. And they get him from blasphemy and all that kind of stuff. And this is kind of the beginning of that blame of uh, blasphemy. And so they say, so then it says in verse 16, Therefore the Jews began to persecute Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Okay, verse 17 says, Jesus responded to them, My father is still working, and I am working also. This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his father and making himself equal to God. Just what I just said. So they began to persecute him even more. They began to dislike him even more. Not only was he saying things that they didn't like, that was kind of convicting them of the life that they were leading but he also was saying that god was his father and they're like what and they're like literally his father not just how we say god is our father but he was saying like god is my father which he is our father but y'all know what i'm saying like he was like in the flesh saying that and they were like scared and confused and all this kind of stuff so not only is he saying these things he's claiming that god's his father but he's also saying 
that he is God and we all know that Jesus is God and God put himself, took himself from an almighty place, a place on a throne where angels were singing where it's glory and goodness and sunny and sunshines and you have all the butterflies and daisies that you want up there and he stepped down from glory to become into flesh as the son of God to feel the wrath of sin and to forget, to die for our forgiveness of sins and eternity and all the other things that comes with loving and knowing and following Jesus. And so then they get really angry and they get really upset, okay? So verse 19 says, Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, the Son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son likewise does these things. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing, and he will show him greater works than these that you will be amazed. As just as, as, just as the Father raises the dead and gives him life, so the Son also gives the life whom he wants. The Father, in fact, judges, judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all people may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Basically, what he's saying here is that he came to do his father's work and what the father does, Jesus does. And one of the things that I love right here um, is that the father, in fact, judges no one but has given off his judgment to the son. That's why so many times you hear people say that Jesus bore all sins. Because... God has every right to judge us in that way, but Jesus, Jesus, Jesus bore that judgment. Is that the right word? Bore. Jesus took on that judgment. The Father doesn't judge anyone. And instead, he's given all of that judgment to the Son. And the Son is there, meaning Jesus, to do the Father's work. And anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And that's even still today. Y'all, this may be in a book from so, so, so long ago, but it's still today. If you don't honor Jesus, if you don't honor Jesus and follow him and love him and give your life and uh, you just surrender to him, then you will not get to the Father. The only way to get to the Father, the only way to get to God is to through is to is through his son Jesus. Simply put, period. Okay? So if you're not following Jesus, if you don't believe in him, then you are not believing in God, okay? So many people are like, I believe in God, but that Jesus guy, like, did he really come down to earth? Did he really die and get thrown into a cave and then, like, the stone roll away and, like, he's coming back? And, like, did he really? And I'm like, yes. And the only way you're going to get to God and the only way you're going to get to heaven is through him. So you better believe it, sis. Okay? Period. <laughs> I don't like people say period, y'all, but it's just funny when I just said that. Lord Jesus, help me. Okay. Yep. Oh, yes. There's the third one, the Holy Spirit. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is in you as soon as you accept Jesus as your Savior. The Holy Spirit activates. Holy Spirit activates. Y'all know those little toys? I always say this. Um, The little toys. This is a sweet, sweet analogy that you got when you were younger. And they're like, some of them are electronic or whatever. I would sometimes get them in Happy Meals at McDonald's too. But you get a little toy and there's a little tab at the bottom. And you pull the tab and then the toy starts. It's almost like take it's almost like you got the battery in there and you know how you got the spring on the battery and you got the battery it's like the tab is between the spring and the battery and when you pull the tab the spring hits the battery and then it activates when you follow jesus and you ask him to be your savior and you give your life to him that tab pulls out and the spring hits the battery and the holy spirit fills your soul and feels inside of you and you have the holy spirit you have even jesus when he left when he um died and then resurrected he even told the people you have something better than me right beside beside you you know when jesus was there y'all and i know i'm going over when Jesus was there, people didn't get to see him every day. You know, his disciples were always near you or whatever, or always near him and that sort of thing. But when Jesus was on earth, y'all, like, some people only heard about him or some people only got to talk to him when they were in, like, while he was um, teaching, you know, 
he, while he was preaching or whatever. They didn't get to see him every day. They didn't, you know, it's not like you could just go to Jesus' house and he was there. Jesus was on the move, y'all. He had stuff to get done, business to be taken care of, and he was on the move, and you didn't get to see him all the time. You got to hear what he had to say. You got to talk to his disciples. You got to whatever you want to do, but you didn't get to see him. You didn't get to talk to him. You didn't have to get to have an intimate relationship with him while he was here on earth, but now you do, sister, and the one way that you get to do that is through the Holy Spirit inside of you. So when you accept Jesus as your Savior and you're, you surrender your life over to Him, that battery and that spring, they hit and the Holy Spirit activates and it is just the most amazing thing ever. So I love it. Um, okay, I'm going to stop there because we are over time and I want to talk about verse 24 the next time. Let's see how much more <clears throat> left of John we have to do. Okay, we got quite a bit, y'all. So... Let's see. Yeah, this is going to be a long series. I'm so excited to talk about chapter 15. I have a ton in my Bible on this. It was one of the biggest things that um, really helped me through a really tough time in my life. Um, so, I'm so excited to get to chapter 15. But we're still in chapter 5, and we're going to pick up on verse 24 next week on Thursday. I saw a quick question about, from somebody that says, do you do this on YouTube, I think it said? Um... Hold on. Say that letter for the ones in the back. A yes, sister. Preach. Um, do you do the Bible studies on YouTube? I don't do them on YouTube, but I post them on YouTube. So if you have to jump off of here ever, or if you just want to go back and listen, or maybe you want to share it with a friend or something like that, I do post them on YouTube the night of. Okay, so, so once I get off of here, I will post it on YouTube, and you can just go and watch it there. Share it with a friend, y'all. If you get, um, if you go to my TikTok bio, you'll see like a little square, and Instagram is in that square, and so is YouTube. And I wanted to tell y'all, before y'all jump off, I know Friday's tomorrow, you gotta prepare for it, you gotta prepare for school work, whatever it is. Um, I wanna tell y'all, please, 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 please go follow me on Instagram, not because I want another follower, but because that is the only way I know how to interact with my Bible study girlies, okay? Um, and because TikTok, I can't get it to post a story anymore. My TikTok is crazy. So Instagram stories is the only way I have to communicate with y'all about a delayed Bible study, a canceled Bible study, or whatever. But yes, all of my sessions, Bible studies, or whatever, are on my YouTube. And I have like cute little titles and stuff like that. So you're sure to find them. Um, as far as my podcast, I did want to say one more thing about that. I am so excited about doing my podcast, y'all. But I need some help on the name. So I'm going to post like a little Instagram story tonight and like a little box um do it tonight or in the morning whenever you have time and just give me some ideas y'all i kind of want it to be relatable to my life relatable to what i stand for what i believe in but i also want it to be sweet and girly and that kind of stuff of course exemplify and set forth jesus but um if you have any ideas then go to my instagram story and give me a little little idea because y'all some of us are more blessed than others in the creativity department and uh that ain't me okay in some things, but not all things. Um, okay, y'all. I love you. If you did not get to watch all this, then just watch it later on YouTube. Share it with a friend. Y'all remember by sharing these Bible studies, and I'm not just saying this for clout. I'm not just saying this because I want some more shares or it's going to up my analytics on TikTok or whatever. No. I'm saying this because when you go and share this with a friend or you go on YouTube and you share it on Facebook, share it on Instagram, whatever it may be, you are literally acting like a physical yield sign from the gates of hell. You are yielding people from going to hell by sharing the goodness and glory of Jesus. And just perhaps maybe someone will change their mind on how they've been feeling about certain things. So, I love y'all. You have a great night. And I'll see y'all next Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Love y'all. Bye. Um, I start Bible studies 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Thursday. Unless otherwise stated on Instagram. Alright. I love y'all. Bye.